Okay, great. So I'm going to talk about, Sahil talked about what do you do when you actually have a business and how do you think about doing strategy and thinking through quarterly reviews and thinking through Notion, stuff like that, and actually running the business. I'm going to talk about growing the business. How do you actually find people? So I have a quick agenda. Uh, first, we're going to talk about painting. Then we're going to talk about music. Then we're going to talk about the radio. And then we're going to talk about personal monopolies. So you've never seen anything, any kind of writing system like this. So first, I'm going to share my favorite painting in the entire world by Paul Signac, Notre Dame de la Garde. So this is what's called a pointillist painting. And I am in love with this painting. I saw it at the Met. It stands in the Impressionist wing on the southern side. I just think it's the most beautiful thing that has ever been cre created. Like, uh, it's almost hard for me not to like look at this and even uh, not get emotional. I mean, I just like the colors and it hangs up in my room. So I've, I have all these memories with this painting now. And I think that from a panoramic perspective, like looking away, low resolution, like it's very pretty. But what I want to do as it pertains to writing is talk about the construction of this painting. So I took these photos when I was at the Met a couple weeks ago, and I'm going to zoom in on the bottom left side first. And what you, you see these two boats right there? I'm going to zoom in and watch what happens. Watch the way that the paint brushes go on the page. What you see is you see these, these, these brushes that are, they're not pointy. They're kind of dashing across. Each brush is fairly different from the next. You have yellows next to greens, next to oranges, next to blues, next to purples. And when you look away, it doesn't quite look like that. But once you kind of jump in, you see this pointillist style. And once again, here's another section of the painting. It's all kind of very textured, thicker brush strokes. And so I think that this is a really good metaphor to, to to start thinking about how we write. So with this painting, what you see is, if you go to it closely, you see these dark kind of coarse grained paint brushes on the foreground. And then as it goes towards the background, it's, it's much finer. And I love this sort of luminous and vibrant aesthetic that comes from this, this painting that I love so much. And so what I wanna do is, I want to remind you that your content strategy is really just that big painting made up of all these little pointillist dots. And so first, what I want to do is I want to give you a picture of your business. And this is what it looks like. We're basically, you're standing there and you have a solution. And there's all these people out there, out in the world. And what's happening is you have a solution and you're saying, okay, customers, I want you to sign up and give me some money in exchange, I will help to solve your problem. And what do people try to do? The first place that everybody goes is they try to reach everybody. Where they go out and they're going to say, oh, I want every single person in the entire world to be my customer as if you're building Amazon Prime. But that's not what we're doing here. We're trying to build internet style businesses that give you an incredible life that probably do multi-million dollars a year. Nobody knows who you are and you get to live wherever you want. You have these fat, fat, fat margins and you get to take care of your family. You get to buy your mom a house. You get to take your dad on a trip and you get to make sure that your kids live an awesome life. So I'm really talking now about building internet businesses like Rite of Passage and Gumroad. So what should you do instead? Well, what you should do is you should teach. And I'm reminded of a quote from a guy named Nathan Berry. And he is the CEO of a company called ConvertKit. And ConvertKit is the platform where I host my newsletters. Really profitable business, sort of like Gumroad. The average person hasn't heard of it, but it's a very interesting company that is changing the lives of creators all around the world. And he has this great quote where he says, if you know a skill that other people use to make money, you can make a living by teaching that skill. Think through the people who are well known in your industry. What do you know? Why do you know who they are? Are they the most talented? Well, sometimes, but often not. Almost always, it's because they teach. 
And so what I want to do is I want to ground this in teaching. So where are we right now? We're trying to create this big painting and each individual teaching session is just one brushstroke. So what does that actually look like? Well, what you want to do is you want to attract people. Most people think, you know what? I'm going to go find people, but people will actually opt in and they will raise their hand. And as you can see here, it's a very small percentage of people, but there's so many people on the internet that your customer base can still be huge. And then what will happen is the audience will grow and the percentage of people that you attract will still be fairly small, but there'll be word of mouth. And even as your audience grows, you'll attract more people. And then soon, soon enough, what's going to happen is you are going to look like when I, in, in our most recent rite of passage, we had students from more than 28 different countries. And if I were to look at a map of our student base, it looks something like this, where we have people all over the world. We have people in Asia, people in Australia, people in Africa, South America, North America, even the people watching this right now follow this kind of map. And then there's always that one Australian guy who goes, you forgot about me, mate. And he's standing there and he comes right in. And even Australian cyclist guy is right here. So my point is, okay, you forgot about me, mate, guy. Time to get you off the screen. My point is that I don't want you to create customers with your content. I want you to create fans. And once you actually have fans of your company, something really interesting begins to happen where what you do is you're just in the middle and you're trying to reach all these different kinds of people. You're trying to figure out who's going to be interested in what I'm doing. And remember, you're starting off and you're saying, I need customers. But the problem is the mistake that I see people making over and over and over again is they shout in all directions. And look what happens to the people. They shout so loud, they shout in every single direction without regard to what the radio wave or the frequency or the message that they're trying to say. And look, people begin to move away. That's not what you wanna do. Instead of shouting, instead of having people moving away, you don't wanna shout, you want to play music. And something really interesting happens when you begin to play music. You pick up your saxophone, you pick up your trumpet, you pick up your piano, you pick up your guitar, and you begin to share an orchestra of observations. Tweets, videos, podcasts, articles, workshops. You can reach the entire world. You can reach people in Asia. You can reach people in Australia. You can reach people in Africa. You can reach people in South America. And you can reach people in North America. And then what you begin to be able to do once you begin to play music is you have all of these different people in a band. So here you got the drummer who's, ke who's keeping the, the pace and all you're doing is you're starting off with just a couple notes. So you're right here, you're just playing ding, ding. That first ding is a tweet, second one is an essay. Then what ends up happening is you're attracting people from everywhere. So now what happens to our circle of friends, the people who we want in our community? Well, once you start playing notes, well, at first, everyone's going to listen. You see it on this map. People will tune in, but you know what? Most people, they, people will give you one shot, but most people, you know what? It's just not right. And they're going to start listening. And this is what will happen. Some people will come in and they'll be part of your tribe. And other people will say, you know what? I, I'm not really thrilled. This isn't what's right for me. And that's totally okay. And then you keep growing. People stay in your circle. And as the clock rolls and the clock continues, more and more people come around. So now you have all these people and your filter gets bigger and bigger where that filter is the sound. It is the, the resonance of your music. And look, most people are outside of your circle. And that is totally okay. In fact, it's totally expected. But as the clock rolls, what you wanna keep doing is keep playing music. Tweets, articles, blog posts, essays, podcasts, just keep that guitar 
playing. And so what I want to do here is I want to switch into an idea that I call the paradox of specificity. And there's a great story from a book called Moneyball. And just to frame the context here is that people, whether you're a creative, whether you're a business owner, you fear specificity. You relish these wide open territories. But the problem is that instead of picking a path and making a commitment, creatives, business owners, they stay in limbo. But I'll tell you, and this is where the paradox of specificity becomes insightful, that specializing often leads to more options in the long run than you thought. And due to their clarity, specific goals galvanize support. Why? Because they're easy to remember them. And as we chase them, as we pursue them, actually the goals begin to grow. And Sahil, I'm curious for you with, with, with Gumroad, it might be a good time for you to pitch in, yeah. was, was hasn't Gumroad expanded in some way so far beyond what you ever imagined at the beginning? Yeah, I, no, I think this is a really interesting idea that the, the, it feels like we've actually narrowed our focus over time, but for some reason that leads to like more growth, you know? It's like, it, and a lot of what I've been doing actually is like going through the product and it's like, I don't know if we need this. I don't know if we need that. Like 30 people use this, 800 people use this, you know, like, let's see if we can consolidate. Let's see if we can get rid of. And I think it's, it's just, it's just like anything. Like people, people want to spend their time either with things they love or, uh, you know, they don't spend their time with things they like. So I think it's kind of a moot to try to be like a li liked by 300 people instead of loved by a hundred you're just going to be, no, no one's going to, no one's going to care, especially in the early days. So I don't yep. know if that feeds into yep. that. I 100% agree with you. Absolutely. So the, my favorite story about this is from a book called Moneyball and it's goes back and there's a story in the book about a guy named Bill James and Michael Lewis writes right from the start, Bill James assumed he had been writing for not a mass audience, but a tiny group of people intensely interested in baseball. So let me tell the story of Bill James. So in 1977, this guy named Bill James, a statistician who's really interested in baseball, publishes a book with the absolutely God-honest boring title of Baseball Abstract featuring 18 categories of statistical information that you can't find anywhere else. If I just put you to sleep, I don't blame you. It's like watching golf on television. But he published his first review and he sold 77 copies in his first year. Then next year, he sold 250. So not that many copies. But eventually, something really interesting happened. He started receiving inquiries from all these people from around the world who were intensely interested in baseball statistics. And What's fascinating is he wasn't just receiving interest from people who had a job in baseball. He was receiving interest from traders who had statistical knowledge that was actually going to help him. He received interest from general managers in, 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 in baseball. He received interest from people in other sports who were looking at statistics from a different angle. He was receiving he was receiving interest from people who worked in government, who were just really interested in how big numbers added up. Maybe someone who worked on American census data. He received interest from board lawyers, math wizards, all these kinds of people who maybe weren't able to hold down jobs. But you know what all these people had in mind? They were mailing Bill James their criticisms, their ideas, their models, and their questions. And soon Michael Lewis writes, that Bill James might have had one of the strangest groups of people ever assembled under one idea. And it reminds me of this quote from Zig Ziglar. What Bill James was able to do was kickstart this, this, this statistics revolution in baseball that led to Billy Bean and the Oakland A's and now the Houston Astros and all the cool things they're doing with analytics. It was this book from 1977. And it reminds me of this quote from Zig Ziglar, who's a mentor of Seth Godin, the very famous marketer and author. And Zig Ziglar says, don't become a wandering generality, be a meaningful specific. And I think he absolutely nails it. So that's where I want to talk about the paradox of specificity. I want to jump in real quick. Go for it. 
like my, one example of this was in, when I was writing that that failure essay, it was it was really tempting to say, hey, how can I generalize this for more people? Like, what are the 15 lessons I learned from, you know, starting this company, raising money, blah, blah, blah. And I, as I got feedback from people, it was pretty clear. Like, they're like, I don't care. Like, I don't, I just want your story. Like, what is your story? Actually, don't, don't try to, I don't, I don't make a single, there's not a single sentence of advice or like, how, this is how you apply blank. It's just like, I'm just going to tell you my story. And I think that's so key with why it worked and why it actually had widespread widespread sort of appeal. I think it's exactly the same point. And when I write fiction, one of my teachers said, this is too vague. Like I like one character's experience is going to be more relevant than like 30, you know, pick like everyone can relate with pain, but only if you write about someone's pain, you know, if that makes sense. Like everyone is an individual, so you should write about individuals. Don't write about generalities because no, no one's a generality. You're not speaking to generalities, you know? Yep. Absolutely. So I want to talk about wavelengths and there are wavelengths. Well, first, let me hold on. Let me just hop in and talk about radios. So when I was growing up, I grew up in San Francisco, big baseball fan. And on 740 every morning, AM 740, that was my dad's favorite channel. And that was the news channel where we'd get in the car and at the top of the hour go, dun, 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 dun. And then they would share the, the news, the three-minute news. That's how my dad would get his news every single morning. And I was a stubborn kid. Dad, I like AM 680. That's where my Giants play. That's where my Warriors play. I would have taped the radio to make sure that no other channel came on because that was my channel. And then when I was with friends, there was a channel called Wild 94.9 that played all the hip hop and pop music in San Francisco. So that's where we would hang out when we were together. And so how does radio work, right? There are these things called radio waves and we can't see radio waves because we can only see a very small fraction of the light spectrum called visible light. And so radio waves are long wavelengths that radio signals pick up and that's how you can hear what's happening on the radio. And then there are shorter radio waves like ultraviolet waves. So what you have is this is the whole spectrum of light waves and we can only see visible light. And so what's happening on the internet? What is happening when you curate a Twitter feed, when you go and you try to sign up for different subreddits? What you're doing is you are curating your own radio station and you are finding your own radio wave. And when we talk about this word, what resonates, right? Resonance is finding people on your wavelength. That's all you're doing. We're not trying to go find customers. We're trying to attract fans who just happen to be on our radio wave. And so what we're doing, remember, we're just playing music, right? We're in a band, we're in a band. And we're at Coachella and there's all these different stages and people are walking, walking, walking. And when they find our stage, they stay and they become fans. But the question is, how do you create a radio station? That is the million dollar question. So there's a couple things that we want to do. The first thing that I recommend is coining a term. Okay, David, that's so helpful. You're saying coin a term. What does that mean? Come on, dude. Give me some examples, please. People, I got you. So these are two really good examples from big companies. The first is HubSpot. The second is a company called IDEO. And HubSpot came up with this idea called inbound marketing. And until HubSpot, all these people just talked about marketing. But it turned out that there was outbound marketing and they came up with this framework where you'd go and you'd actually reach customers. And then there's inbound marketing where you have a methodology and other people come to you. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. And then there's IDEO. When somebody thinks of design thinking, they think of this company called IDEO almost no matter what. They have what's called a personal monopoly. Both of these companies have what I call a personal monopoly on inbound marketing and design thinking. They have coined those terms. So what are the benefits of coining terms? Well, when it comes to search engine optimization, no competition. Then when it comes to, if you study some really good strategists, you know what they'll say to you? They'll say, don't try to move the pieces on the board, 
and be the best at that. You want to actually create the board itself. That is the kind of 3D chess that you're doing when you're coining terms. You are actually shaping how people are thinking about your industry. And that is the highest leverage place to be. So what are some examples of this? Well, I talked about the personal monopoly. So this is my term that I coined that we talk about all the time in Rite of Passage. And I say that the secret to internet marketing is to be known for something. Mary Meeker, the famous venture capitalist with an internet trends report. There's an acquired FM podcast, which I highly recommend that tells the story of all these cool acquisitions in Silicon Valley, with Disney, with, with, with Facebook, Instagram. Then there is my friend, Webb Smith. He has this newsletter called 2 p.m. And he's built a whole business around that newsletter. 2 p.m. comes around, I think of Webb. He made it his thing. He, all of them use it to actually teach their industry. And through it, they've all built personal monopolies. So the question is, when do you know that you're doing this right? And I'll show you. When people on other parts of the internet start using your terminology. You can see Michael, Dave, and an anonymous person on Twitter actually promoting my own ideas and using it as part of their language. That is what it means to create the actual board and to coin terms. So to, what I want to do is I want to share who are some of these, what I'm going to call from now on, wavelength warriors. Who are our wavelength warriors? It just so happens we have two of them here right now. The first is Sahil. Look at what he's doing. His pin tweet is actually him saying, look, I'm going to share my Q&A. This is what we are doing as an organization, where we're going, how we're thinking about things, where we're struggling, memberships, impact of coronavirus on the creator economy how we think about what to work on. And he's saying, if you're interested in this, step into our orbit. Sahil, is there anything you want to add to this? Um, no, I think you nailed it. I think if I were to pick a term that I'm trying to coin, open board meeting is a good one. Yeah, so that's a, a very good one. Great example. Absolutely. And then Anna, what she's doing, Anna, you want to present on how you're thinking about about this tweet and how this tweet frames all the work that we're doing together? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so can you all hear me? Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm a former elementary school teacher and I grew discontent with the system and with the way things were going in the school and my inability to transcend it. Um, and I started to question everything, everything. Um, and then this, this particular tweet is just kind of like the basics of something that we all know, we've all been through this, we can all relate to this topic because we've all been through some form of schooling. Um, and, and it was just a provocative way to get people to think about the things that are already in their mind, but sometimes they need to read it this way in order to realize that this is going on. Um, and then really, if anyone goes in my profile and wants to know the things that I'm talking about or what I'm thinking or what's driving my mission, this tweet really summarizes that. It's kind of like the, you know, my confusion and where I'm working from. So yeah, that's the one that I have up there and that resonated with a lot of people. And as you can see, 17,000 likes. So what has happened from this tweet is Ann and I, if we've launched our summer camp, we have all these teachers and educators from around the world, no hyperbole, all over the place, reaching out to us saying, how can I help? How can I get my kids in summer camp? Because they have been looking, 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 scanning the radio, changing stations, boom. They found Anna's channel and now they're saying, I want my kids to be a part of this. I want to get involved. And if we ever need to hire or anything like that, this is super helpful for us. And then likewise, what I do is I frame Rite of Passage as a big alternative to traditional writing education. And Rite of Passage isn't just a writing school. It is a place to become what I call a citizen of the internet. And I frame what real life is against school in that some of the things that school gets wrong. In school, we learn in private. We follow the syllabus. We write for the teacher. You spend, you, you spend 15 years in school. You write for one person, your teachers. In real life, in rite of passage, you learn in public, you follow your curiosity, and you get to write for a global audience. And then you see this all over the place. 
people like Carnivore Aurelius. It is an anonymous ca- account that I don't even, you know, who knows who's behind this, but they're coming out. They're pro a heavy meat diet. They're saying meat is bad for you. The sun is bad for you. Fasting is bad for you. It's like a revolt against the modern world. And you might say, you know what? Eating meat is bad. I disagree that, that, that fasting is bad for you. I actually think that that's really, I actually agree that fasting is bad for you. Or you could say, whoa, they are speaking to me right now. This is exactly what I believe. And you get right on their wavelength. Their goal isn't to get every single customer in the world. Their goal is to find the right people. Then there's David at Basecamp, co-founder of Basecamp. And they are always going against venture capital. They're always going, they, they, they have a way of building things, a way of operating internally, a code of ethics that they are loud about. And they have attracted a series of not just customers, but fans of the business. And then there's Barstool Sports. You might hate Barstool. You might love Barstool, but all of you have an opinion on Barstool after two minutes of scrolling that feed. That is what Barstool is doing. They're trying to say, we want people to either love us or hate us, and we don't want anyone in the middle. That is finding the wavelength. So it gets back into the paradox of specificity. On the internet, the narrower your brand, the more opportunities come to you. The internet is the best matching tool ever invented. So pick a niche, learn all about it, and share what you learn by writing online. Then you'll watch your life improve. And once again, you begin to see other people actually writing about your ideas. And check this out. Yeah, go for it. One thing real quick. Um, I think a lot of folks, they look at some of these examples of, of folks who found a lot of success on the internet and they think that it's because they're appealing to generalities and like if you and, and that's just because you don't see the through line you think that it, they're writing about everything um but then you realize like if you look at my feed i basically say the same thing over and over again you know you just you don't notice it because you're not in my head but i'm basically saying everyone should start a business and I, I basically motivate people to start businesses. That's like, if you look at every single thing that I tweet, you'll probably see that through line. Naval, same thing. Like people think, oh, Naval, he tweets about all these things. No, he doesn't. He tweets about one thing. Uh, I'll let people figure that one out though. Ah, some mystery. So, <laughs> so, so we have the paradox of, of specificity and then we have Joe Wells actually writing about this idea. And guess what? The idea about Bill James and Moneyball that I talked about earlier, I never read the book. I got that idea from Joe's article because Joe is doing the work for me. So now what I have is I put out these ideas about writing into the world and all these people from around the world take my idea, they begin to spin off of it and they begin to add add to it. And then what you find is you begin to find your beats, your drum beats, And then you begin to find other bands who you want to make remixes with, other bands who are playing on that same genre as you. And what you see is right here, build for everyone and you build for no one, build for one person and you build for thousands. From Sahil, he had no idea that I was thinking about this, but then I can take that idea and I can start adding it. So what we're doing here, just to recap, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a band, basically. We're trying to teach, to have an ensemble of education. And remember, you have all these different instruments at your disposal. You have tweets, you have essays, podcasts, emails, and workshops just like this one. And as you teach, you'll attract all these like-minded people with every single new note that you put down. Ding, 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 ding. You'll attract employees, customers, clients, partners, media coverage, you name it. And they won't just be customers, they'll be fans. And what'll happen is they will come together. You'll build this tribe of people. You'll forget about the rest of the world. You'll have your people, these like-minded people, this community, a real community of all these people who share similar beliefs. And over time, you'll end up building that painting out of a series of small little brushstrokes. There we go, everybody. Thank you.